Reggie. Shark straw. <laughs> you know it's coming. Uh, Reggie's going to talk about uh, the environmental side of things, and he has a rather elaborate, lengthy uh, name for his presentation, so I'll let him go through that. Which one you are? That is not what I have on the sheet. I know. <laughs> um, first, they need to educate me. Do I have it the right way? And it is down. Um, I don't know. Yep. Okay. Go back. Okay. Huh. Now that all the cool stuff is done with, now you get, and you're at that point in the day where you're nice and full and tolerant. It's a regular place. Huh? Well, not. <laughs> Can I be here? No, no further. You're not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, well, I represent the environmental department here at Cisco, uh, and there's three of us. There's Kelly Sullivan, she's another environmental scientist. Some of you may have been involved with her. And then we have a younger guy, uh, Andrew Moskovitz, he's our environmental engineer. Uh, he's the smarter of all and he's younger. And the so one thing we wanted to present here for you guys is. Some of the issues that we've heard come from various sites that you guys have run into problems and because these problems have come to us, we tried to make a presentation that would demonstrate or help resolve issues uh, so that you could be a little more preemptive and not run into these problems. And so this is our attempt to do so for the most common. So here we go. So. There's going to be some technical questions if it's over your head. If it's over your head. So the first question is, what time does that clock stay? Come on, guys. I know it's hard stuff. I know you're full. AM or PM? PM. You get PM. Good. OK, 11.58 PM. Second technical question, does anyone know who that is? So we, how do you know it? <laughs> so whenever you look for what time to get more state coming up, that's not part of the presentation. That's just a cool slide to have. Uh, yeah. The other, the other item here is for the purposes of this section of the presentation, we're going to suggest that the time is couple of minutes before midnight and your auto cal is for about 7.15 in the morning. That's just to give you a basis for potential problems you could run into. Boom, look at me, I've mastered it already. So one of the first sections is the walls of some sites have, uh, have a principle of just kind of setting the auto cal, set it and forget it, and that's their basic principle. Um, one of the things we want to caution you on that type of principle is the potential problems you could have if you're not daily or regularly checking your calibration, if you're just assuming that everything's going to go smoothly. Uh, number one, the natural tendency of analyzers to drift. As uh, you can imagine, uh, you could go five days and you could ultimately fail that five times the 2x performance spec for part 60, and then your, your data becomes invalid at that point. Obviously, it's not a drastic an issue, but the whole point is to limit your downtime in general. So we wanted to kind of address this issue of not having a general principle of just setting your auto cal and forgetting it so that you can eliminate potential pitfalls like this one. Second one, just infrequent operation can affect the 26 clock hour required. And remember, especially with the, uh, especially with, if you imagine if you do, remember our earlier slide. Wrong way. I didn't master it. 
uh, our other site, it's 1158 p.m. You're doing an online cal at 7.15 every day, or you're doing a cal auto cal at 7.15 every day in the morning. Imagine your first day, you do a cal offline. Second day, you do a cal, oh, first day you do a cal online. Second day, you do a cal offline. Third day, you do a cal online. Fourth day, you do a cal several hours later. And so now you're beyond the 26 unit operating day, uh, unit operating hours, and you just happen to run your calibration uh, app. You happen to run an online calibration and you find your data is invalid simply because you didn't meet the 26 unit operating requirement. Now, obviously, many of you who do a lot of EDR kind of work, you recognize that. You can alleviate this problem by using the online offline determination so that that uh, offline calibration becomes something that protects you from stuff like this. But once again, we're just trying to be preemptive and prevent you from having unnecessary concerns after the fact. Uh, thirdly, the late night startup can affect the unit operating day. Remember, anytime you combust fuel even for a minute, you're required to have a calibration. And this really comes into play for things like seven day drift. If you ever have an analyzer issue where you're drip, uh, you have to do a seven day drift as part of bringing it back into compliance, you could potentially start up at, remember the clock, 11.58, you did an online cal, you could, do an, you could start up at 11.58. What happens at midnight? The new day, and so you don't have a you don't have a calibration to represent that day, and so these are just some basic problems that have come up, and we're just trying to address the issue before they become bigger problems. And then you call me and you ask me, hey, what can we do? And I tell you, I can make up an answer if it's one or not. <laughs> Hopefully, it's a real answer. Can I just real quick? No. Go ahead. <laughs> How would the offline cal protect you? So, um, and this is specifically part 75, allows you to do a, what's called an online offline determination. And what it permits is if you have an offline cal and an online cal within 24 hours of each other that have passed the, the normal performance spec for 75. You can use that as a you can use that as a daily calibration check, but ultimately over 26 unit operating hours, which could extend days, you still have to get an online cal. But for the normal daily cows, you can get away with using the offline cal. Does that make sense? So you did, it's, a, it's a one time test. Uh, and most times we do it for many of you, we've done the certification for you and we will we'll automatically put that test in there to protect you sometimes from yourself. So if you knew that you're going to start taking the situation. Technic, what is the beauty of this is when can you do a unit, can you do a online offline calibration retroactively. Any guesses? Then you can answer because you know. <laughs> yes. So I can fail that test and I can go back in time and find uh, online offline data uh, calibration and generate that one time test and use it. Like I said, I'm just trying to prevent uh, information so that you're not worried about things like that. It's not a bad idea to just have an online offline calibration. We're just pointing out the sites that don't do that, this little preemptive thing to do for prevent these kind of problems. Don't cause any more trouble. Anyway. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Kevin kind of went over this one, and this is something that's 
for pointing out to us more recently by a, another site, and we got her to get things to warn the rest of you about it. And that's doing calibration, doing post uh, test calibration. Part of my linear graph is whether I'm a handsy guy. I, I think I can be this. Uh, so, what the, this line is supposed to be is for 4A, 4B, and 4C, they should try set instead of being in linear. You get what I'm saying? It's supposed to be like this. So, imagine this. It's supposed to be <laughs> like this. Because I'm not good at graphs, you get what you get. So, anyway, so imagine uh, this has uh, as a as a, whatever this picture is called, and uh, part 75 parameters, this doesn't really affect it, really only affects part 60 parameters. So imagine running a passing online cal on day one, a passing offline cal on day two, day three, you have a passing online cal, and after that cal, you do a CPA. Day 4A, you failed the cow based on the two kinds of performance test. Is there anything wrong with the data? What's that? Nope, there's nothing wrong with the data. Uh, regulatorily, you just need to adjust the analyzer back and put it in spec. The only time it becomes out of control is if it that happens five days in a row. For this, the data is still good, there's no problem. Scenario 4B, you fail four times the performance test. What happens? And this is what Kevin was alluding to. Uh, the data becomes invalid backwards for part 60, which isn't a big deal if you're going back to simply the, the cow before. But if going backwards to that passing cow means you go through a CTA or a, a RAD, you're kind of screwed. And so the, what we're recommending is if you run a calibration right after that, specifically the RAD, while the source test is still there and you pass, everything's good. Even if you fail, they're still there and you don't have to redeploy them back to the site if you find out two days later because you were down the next day and then you came back online. So, we, like I said, these things are just the kind of Help you guys out with things we've been exposed to and share the information. And then, this is one, especially as we come up with a couple of times, and this one regarding the tracking the seven day drift. One of the semi shortcomings of within CDAR is we have this cool seven day drift checker. You can kind of see over here, you can select the parameter over here, uh, the seven, you can see down below seven day drift evaluation, and it pulls up this cool thing. You set the time range as well as you have the parameter you want to check. And it will, uh, once you click on the next button, you'll get this screen which shows you, with the, I think that's blue, I'm colorblind, so I'm assuming those are blue check marks. With the blue check mark, you see seven days, seven unit operating days uh, for the seven day drift test. And it seems like the test is past successful. But one of the problem, one of the shortcomings is within the seven day drift vector, it only checks days when you've done calibration. It doesn't necessarily at this point check if the unit operated without a calibration. And for the seven day drift test, you have to run a cal every day you operate. And so what, what I've been recommending, and this is what it would look like when you press that, that uh, when you say button there, this is what it would look like. You get this cool little report, and as you can see, uh, between the 20th and the 23rd, there's two days missing. Remember, the way Part 60 is written now, you're no longer under obligation to have seven consecutive days anymore. 
It's like the, even the language in 60 said seven days in which the unit is operating. So it has the same language as part 75 now, so we don't have that issue of somehow making them operate the same way. And so the issue is we need to confirm whenever you're doing the seven day trip, whether it's an initial certification or it's an issue of doing a recertification because there's an analyzer issue. You want to confirm that those two days were definitely offline. So you're meeting the seven unit operating day criteria. And if we go to the next slide. Uh, within CR, the report generator, uh, what I typically do is I just go to the monthly operating report or go anywhere where I'm getting operating information to determine if there's fuel flow, if there's some form of operation we have on the report, you can have unit operate, uh, unit operating time. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that for the 21st and 22nd, the unit is clearly down. That seven day drip test is solved. So, just issues that come up, uh, we want you guys to be aware of. So, fuel flow meters that every year new fuel flow meters that come up. Um, the Coriolis meter is one of the most common ones that comes up with issues. From sites that switch to a more unit. And it, it's one of the most awkward ones because the EPA even acknowledges, uh, in at least in interacting at conferences, they acknowledge, uh, Charles Freshour in particular has acknowledged that he doesn't understand why they haven't been standardized. And every time you petition, you, the petition goes through. So, but one of the things is, uh, if you switch to Coriolis meter for whatever reason, you, it works better for your facility. Uh, currently, EPA is exploring standardizing it, but if you're not going to petition, excuse me, the lunch is coming back. Uh, if you're not going to petition, you can calibrate the Coriolis meters according to part 75 standards where you're comparing it uh, to inline flow or you can compare it, send it out for them to compare it against flow against something else. And you don't need the petition, but if you want to use it based on its own technology, you're going to have to petition. And every time you petition them, it will go through. I've been involved with three or four petitions so far and they've gone through without the issue. And so it's just one of those things that I, even EPA does, I think they're in the midst of finally standardizing these. This is one Melissa and I came across. Sometimes you come across new meters um, and simply because you have a part 75 site, you may conclude I have a part 75 site, I have a fuel flow meter, I can use it because I'm part 75. Well, the end bar meter you can use for part 75 is the differential pressure meter, but you have to use as a differential pressure meter according, uh, according to the requirements of part 75. Or you can do use the standard part 75 methodology where inline inline comparison or send it out to compare flow. The issue is what we ran into the facility, we're just talking about you, uh, <laughs> the end bar issue. Uh, one of the things the, uh, is because the end bar, from my understanding, and talking with the EPA site, the end bar has a lot of similarity with the orifice plate in how it operates. And so this particular facility was basically doing the same type of uh, calibrations that you do for an orifice plate. Orifice plate allows you to do something that other meters don't have. Orifice, uh, nozzle, and venturi allow you to do what? You're nodding, so I know you're a little. You're just a agreeable. You're a agreeable guy. Uh, does anyone know? 
you, you have an option with those types of meters that you don't have with standard meters. Well, it allows you to do transmitter transducer. So you can calibrate the transmitter instead of calibrating the flow meter itself, which makes it nice. You don't have to take the meter out, you just calibrate the transmitter. And because this particular site saw the similarity, they were using the transmitter transducer test to meet the part 75, but that's not permitted, even though their similarities are almost like dinner. And so that's why there's a question mark by the petition. The issue is right now, it, uh, we're in the middle of a petition of trying to get them to accept this because the principles of the principles are similar and it has a primary element uh, component to it. So, but in general, if you're using something new, either use the part 75 or appendix C normal methodology. Uh, don't assume just because you're part 75, the type of flow meter you have is accepted. Uh, you're welcome to call any of us at Cisco and we can walk you through it. Uh, currently, we're in the conversation with the EPA on this particular one. Uh, they've allowed us to submit technical information from the manufacturer to potentially make this similar, uh, similar to the work that's needed. So that's where we're at. Finally, on the flow meter, uh, fill flow to load, a lot of missteps. And problem. One of the options you have in using a fuel flow meter under part 75, for those of you who don't want to get in the habit of annually calibrating your meter, you have this option to do a fuel flow to load baseline test and then quarterly run the fuel flow to load test. The issue comes down to this. If you have a system that has duct burners and combustion turbine fuel flow meters, the issue especially after initial certification, you want to make sure, especially with speedar uh, or breeze, you want to make sure that both of those components are close in time because whichever one is, whichever one is earlier sets the timeline for when the next test is due or when, when the test expires. And what I mean is, imagine you run a a duct burner calibration, duct burner fuel meter calibration, uh, quarter two of 2021, and then you calibrate the combustion turbine meter in quarter four of 2021. The time limiter is that second quarter. And so when you, you'll be thinking that you have two extra quarters of valid, a valid time, but it's going to expire two months, two quarters earlier than you expect. So you want to make sure your cap, your meters, if you have two meters determining your fuel flow system, that they're close in time, preferably in the same quarter. Because remember, the fuel flow meters in general last uh, last four operating quarters. And that's from the time of the earliest component in the system. So, uh, people are opposed to us the idea of separating out the two components uh, at two different systems. And I don't think we have that capability to be. Probably not. Probably. Um, so it is what it is. So let's just head up. Secondly, the fuel meter system uh, with primary element inspection. The other issue that's been coming up pretty regularly is whenever you do similarly, you want to have both meters or the single meter uh, or both meters in the same order as much possible. But also in the case of a primary element inspection, especially like orifice plate, you want to make sure that orifice plate is in either in the same quarter or an adjacent quarter. That's simply the rule. Because you can 
Unfortunately, a lot of times, those of you who work in DCMPS a lot of time, you can input the data, the QA data just fine, and it will pass the test just fine. But when you run your EDR or you're comparing the actual hourly data to it, you'll find that that data is invalid. And so, but as we go along, all of us who have been exposed to ECMPS for any length of time, you've been noting that it's getting smarter and smarter every quarter. And once again, this is this is kind of a warning or a cautionary tale. Let's address these, be preemptive in addressing these issues. That's the flow. Wait, when you say same or adjacent quarter, the primary element of inspection needs to be adjacent to what the the, the actual calibrations as well? Correct. Okay. Yeah. This is a new one that just came up and it's, I'm putting it out more as a, we're in the process of interacting with the EPA uh, and it's just kind of a heads up for future, but I wanted to put it out there because it's out there and I need to make a whole bunch of points on my slides and stuff and this is my own. So, one of the typically uh, performance spec four is for carbon monoxide. The issue we, we just recently ran into is four, which you can see is applicable for analyzers of 1000 ppm. 4A is applicable for analyzers less than 200 ppm. 4B appears to be for dual range analyzers, but their, their ranges are greater than 200 ppm and 3000 ppm. So most sites have low ranges 10 to 50 ppm at most. And then a high range can go anywhere from 200 to 3,000. And so the issue is which performance that we pick and choose or do, or do they fit neatly into one or the other. Historically, we use 4 and 4A without any issue. Because this question came up and it's a reasonable question, we want to address it before it becomes a real question, before the, uh, they can appreciate this one. Uh, Several years ago, we contacted the EPA regarding seven day drip. And the issue was the site tripped and didn't run a cow, but they came up the next day, they didn't touch anything, and they rerun the cow the next day. And we contacted the EPA and said, Can we continue the seven day drip check as is? Because we didn't address, adjust anything, and we just continued on. And they said yes. And we had a cool email to say that and everything. And we kept it in our hip pocket for anyone who would challenge it. And then several years later, we ran into the same issue and we showed them our cool email. And the EPA said, wrong. You startled. Even though you didn't adjust anything. And they said, the, the person who said that said, we're good intention, so it doesn't retroactively affect anything. But going forward, you would start up. And so <laughs> we're trying to prevent that with addressing this so that they don't say it's like, no, that's not what it is. So right now we're in the midst of addressing this issue. We've got communication going out to the EPA to address this issue. And here's our big project. So one of the major questions that comes up to us, uh, our department regularly, whether it be the Black Arts Department, also known as software, uh, the engineering nerds, our customers. Uh, one of the things that the question comes up, we have an analyzer that's under part 60 um, that the analyzer had a malfunction, we're going to have to replace a part. What do we have to do to bring it into the farm? What testing do we have to do? So, historically, our response was based on the EPA interaction with the EPA through conferences and conversation. 
for the EPA said, if you if you take reasonable action to bring back the compliance, we won't have a problem. And so our understanding was, hey, if you follow the principles of Part 75 that addresses all these issues, is it with the only exception of substituting CGAs for linearity, are you using the appropriate test as a reasonable action? Or replacing the CO response time test or a cycle time test? We felt that was reasonable. And we instructed you guys for several years that's the way. And so we got to a point where we said, hey, it would be nice to have documentation from the EPA on this issue. So, like a fool, I contacted the EPA. It's said, hey, it's like, in this so, if we follow the guideline, Part 75 provides an exhaustive list of scenarios and what tests to do to bring it in compliance, will you accept it? And a young lady by the name of Kim Garnett hurt my feelings and said, no, we consider that if, if you fail anything, including if you fail a calibration, Simply because you didn't turn the gas on, they consider that an out of control event and you could potentially need to recertify. And so our feelings were hurt because we did, because Kim was always giving us cool answers, and all of a sudden she turned on us with that one. So, but she gave us this cool ray of hope, which is the reason for our current fiscal response. The authority to oversee compliance with Part 60 has been delegated to, in most cases, the state or local area. The EPA regional office is delegated is a delegated authority in some cases. So the answer to a lot of your questions would be up to the compliance authority responsible for a particular facility. Yeah. Oh. And so, as a result, uh, my team, along with Taylor or Shane, She's my daughter, I call her. Uh, we went, we undertook this, this whole thing to address this state by state. And what and the purpose of this was to address the issue, to address this issue so that whenever you guys called us, we weren't simply saying, hey, contact your state or your state agency. We would be able to give you guys good information right off the bat, or at least direct you to the right people. And so now, all of our answers are based, uh, we find that based on what we've experienced so far, we, the answers are one of four. Um, they allow Part 75, or they have a state plan already that addresses that, uh, like states like Pennsylvania, Colorado, I was surprised, actually allows Part 75 stuff uh, in place of 60. Um, the other option is Part 75 is allowable, but they want you to contact them anyway, which we're fine with it. So that way you can at least start the testing. Like I said, you're going to substitute CPAs for linearity and your response test for the second. Uh, if you deal with the other. And then C, Part 75 allows when the agency is an avail unavailable. Because one of the things we kept running into is they would say, no, we want you to contact us every time. Well, what's the problem here? If you have an analog to go down and you can resolve the issue, and there it's the weekend, you don't want to wait till they come to you contact them because you're accumulating downtime. And so one of the things we emphasize with them is, hey, what can they do? They have these examples to follow. They can address the issue before it. And so what uh, some sites have allowed, hey, yeah, go ahead. If we're not available, follow Part 75, then contact us later. We may have to do that. And then there's the Stay up your line, agency. Contact us anyway. No matter. And these are the people who also make the uh, make the statement. We're so busy, we don't know how quickly we get to. Well, we're trying to alleviate you of some of those issues by 
creating this uh, scenario in part 75 to address the issue, why not follow it? So Reggie on that, I mean, so it sounds like you guys talked to a lot of states and our districts too. We are, I think we're about 33% in. Uh, we still have, I think we, we got answers, some form of solid answer from about 17 states. Because we didn't just, and, and I'm going to get to that point. I, I didn't want to send everything all out at one time because I figured there'd be nuance where we'd have to refine our approach. Uh, so we got a really nice refined. Because I'm wondering how many of those agencies you talked to said, what is part 16, what's part 75? We're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> High five for morale. Uh, so we get to the process. We sent out this general email. We started with 10 states uh, where we simply said, hey, can we follow the principles of Part 75 for uh, analyzer repairs slash lifetime replacement, which is substituting CPAs and whatnot for their comparable linearity cycle time test. And then said they would respond, and they would be evaluating the response and report the ones we want, and but other times we would have to clarify. The first clarification we ran into was when they brought up, it's like, well, we don't, we don't know what part 75, so we modified our letter to include an attachment of the part 75 policy manual slash technical Q&A manual now. And so we sent out the next group. Uh, we sent out a few more. Uh, Follow that up with the next question was, we don't think it's like following part 75, we want, uh, as I alluded to earlier, we want this, we want them to contact us. And so we brought up the issue of we revised our letter to include contacting you isn't always the best issue because sites, especially on weekends, holidays, they may not be able to get a hold of you, and that means there's potential downtime in, in the meantime. And with the whole idea to have for availability, you want something already in place. So we modified it, and that's where we start getting responses in. Um, I have a question. It says, do you, did you include those correspondence from states that were provided to Cisco during DOS setup? Did you include those correspondence from states that were provided to Cisco during DOS setup? Um, because uh, in terms of when we're doing the DOS tech setup, uh, but we, because it's so new, we haven't involved it with any DOS tech stuff. But um, when we do, once we have every state resolved, it would be a good idea that we can do that when we're doing the DOS review. So that uh, when they do run those issues, we, but that's not really a DOS tech thing, that's just a fix the analyzer. If they can clarify their question a little more, uh, I might be able to answer that. The third issue came up, and this was the one that really caught us up. Is state agencies abdicating their authority to the feds because they didn't realize they had the authority? So they would say, we don't have the right to make it, we don't have the right to use part 75 and that's why we were glad we got that cool email from uh, Kim Garnett that says, it tells them that this is under their authority. And so we gained a little more traction. And so we're at the point now where I think we're ready to just send out the rest of the, the letters now that we feel like we have a full refinement. And this is, this is not a good slide. <laughs> I'm not technologically savvy, so don't judge me. Uh, the whole thing, you can see, you can at least see the M in Massachusetts. Uh, we've gotten through the M's, and this, uh, 
this particular spreadsheet is actually more extended and uh, Taylor here is responsible for pre helping to create it along with uh, our, our environmental engineer, uh, Andy Moskovich. And we've got to a point where whenever you guys contact it from your perspective state, we would be able to respond to you uh, more actively and more accurately so that we won't just be telling you contact your state, we may even have a specific answer for you to take action immediately. So that's yeah, probably enough question. I'm not asking anything. So when you say that we do a linear instead of a CGA, what if it's Refer. Oh. Yeah. Okay, instead of doing CGA, you do a linear. No. Or is it a linear? Yeah. Okay. okay. But the system is set up to do CGA and CO. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's what I mean. Like on the low range, like a lot of times on, imagine even for a NOx analyzer. Uh, on the low range, you can do a CGA. Uh, on the high range, you're going to do a linearity. And so, under Part 75, you wouldn't do under Part 75, you wouldn't do a linearity at all on that low range. But we're saying go ahead and do that CGA even on the low range for NOx to demonstrate that analyzer is back in time. Right. So. She clarified. Um, so it's Ada Galloy. Ida. Mm -hmm. We have provided clarifications on data validation based on state guidance. I think that's a different. Uh, that's a different topic. This isn't. Uh, we're not talking about the issue of making the data valid. Uh, and we're just asking what can we do to bring the analyzer back into compliance. Uh, one thing is like part 60, uh, and, and it might be something I do not need to talk about on the phone. Under part 60, there's no guideline how to bring your analyzer back into compliance if something goes wrong. But part 75 has this exhaustive list of a variety of scenarios. The only difference is it uses certain tests uh, like linearity where you would just replace the CTA. So, so Reggie, based on that, that's where I was going to go. Is part, if part 60 is silent, which it is, mm -hmm. and the state and or local district claims ignorance, which they are in most cases, why do you got to do anything? Because that, that's that's kind of where we're at. I mean, you, and, and and I appreciate. I mean, it'll be once you finish this table, and some states care, and they and they will give you guidance. That's great, but I, I'm almost afraid of pushing this. What I found working with agencies that don't know much, you're likely going to get an answer you don't want. Because you're dealing with people who are afraid to make. That's right. Yeah, that's it. If if, if uh, Part 60 silent, and it is. So I, I'm comfortable saying. Based on history, what you're saying seems to be true. We've simply, like we've sent, like sites that are just followed 75 principle, even under audit, there's been no issue. We just wanted yeah. something hard written so yeah. that we could instruct. I mean, better. I mean, a perfect example is you replace your CO analyzer. Yeah. Part 75 is irrelevant. Yeah. Part 60 is silent. Yeah. And so we would say, like many of the states would say, just do CGA like you would for yeah. and point, but you're absolutely right. Uh, historically, uh, I would, I guess, uh, I wouldn't recommend doing nothing, but in terms of contacting the agency. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the, the big deal, you change your analyzer out of season, you need to do a wrap, but if part 60 is not requiring you to, to do that, why you bring out a vendor to do a wrap if you don't really have to, right? And that, it's a gamble either yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> it's your pick your poison kind of thing. I, I, I can see to your point. Because yeah. uh, it is one, because as Kevin and I were kind of joking, even in Pennsylvania, we, depending on the regulator you get, you can get totally different answers. Sure. Right? Uh, and once one regulator makes that, they're not going, the other one's not going to overturn them. So right. your point's valid. So, it's very, I think it's very state and or district specific. So. 
but for the state that you have pretty solid answers, hopefully we can provide you some more effective guidance. And that's my presentation. Any questions? You like you ask them all. Are you good? And go. Thanks, Ricky. Always entertaining. <laughs>